So for the last four years of my undergraduate career, I've been working on this collaborative development project in Africa. And I found myself becoming very sensitive to the kind of rhetoric that we use to describe this kind of development work. This is what we usually see coming out of uh, development uh, media and advertising agencies. What you find is that the semantics here all describe an exchange of knowledge or uh, power or influence from the developed countries to the developing countries. I mean, the word empower, sure it sounds noble, empowering women or empowering the youth, but in fact, it literally means giving power. So my question is, what makes us think that these people were powerless to begin with? My story starts with a simple definition. Hydroelectric power, or hydropower for short, is essentially just the generation of electricity using the kinetic energy of flowing water. I like to think of it as a water wheel. Now, this water wheel has two key components that we need to understand a little bit better before moving forward. The first is the housing. The housing is essentially just a metal enclosure used to contain the large hydrostatic pressures associated with the flowing water. The second is the runner. The runner is the actual water wheel component itself. Collectively, collectively, we call this device the hydropower turbine. Now, hydropower technology is nothing new. In fact, it's the world's largest source of renewable energy. In sub-Saharan Africa, where 30 of the 48 countries experience daily power outages, hydropower resources are abundant. In Cameroon, the country where I've been working, there's an estimated 12 gigawatts of renewable hydropower potential, but only about 8% of that has yet been exploited. And much of this is coming from large hydropower, which focuses its energy on areas of highest, highest population density. So what happens to these people in the rural communities? Oftentimes, they're left in the dark. This is where ACREST comes in. ACREST stands for the African Center for Renewable Energy and Sustainable Technology. It's an indigenous, non-governmental organization focusing on availing appropriate technologies to those living in rural communities in an effort to reduce poverty. ACREST discovered hydropower back in the late 2000s, and within a few years, they were already generating electricity. However, they were not reaching the efficiencies or the capacities that they had always hoped for. So they contacted my team at Purdue, team of engineering students, in order to come up with a collaborative design to hopefully reach those efficiencies. The first thing our team did was to establish a list of critical success criteria how do we gauge success in this project? The first, adherence. Whatever we design has to adhere to the local environmental conditions. That is, it has to maintain a high efficiency year-round under variable rainfall conditions. The second, replicability. Whatever we design has to be replicable by our Cameroonian counterparts using the machinery and the equipment that they have on site. The third, localism. Whatever we design should be sourcing locally available resources and uh, labor. The fourth, sustainability. Whatever we design has to be environmentally and economically sustainable. So our engineers took a close look at what ACREST was doing before we got there in order to find inherent inefficiencies in their designs. And what we found was there's a large space between the runner and the housing such that as water passes through the turbine, much of it's flowing over the runner rather than into it, and therefore much of that natural energy is not being converted into electricity. The simplest solution here is to increase the size of the runner, thereby decreasing the, g the gap between the runner and the housing, such that as the water passes through now, more of that, more of that water is hitting the runner and generating, the generating electricity. Therefore, you have a higher efficiency. This is exactly what our engineers did. In 2012, our team established its first hydropower prototype, what we're calling prototype one. Now, this design was utilized um, was, was realized using uh, some of the most advanced machinery and equipment that we have today. CNC routers, water jet machine cutters, we use computer modeling and simulation to affirm its efficiencies. It was then loaded onto a plane and hauled over to Africa, and from there it was trucked up to the village and installed in site. But what happens next remains a bit of a mystery, as nobody was there to witness it firsthand. Here are the facts. About three weeks into testing, the turbine suffered a catastrophic failure. The damage was extensive. About eight of the 20 runner blades were ripped from the assembly, and both of the end discs experienced partial shearing. What could have caused this? Oddly enough, we suspect this, the raffia palm seed. It's no larger than a pine cone, and it weighs only a few ounces, but it was enough to systematically destroy the turbine. Let's take a look at how this might have happened. 
the seed would have entered the turbine at over 100 miles per hour, and upon making contact with that runner blade, would have generated a stress of over 800 megapascals. 800 megapascals is a huge stress. In terms of pressure, it's eight times the pressure at the bottom of Mariana Trench, the lowest point on the Earth's ocean. So why wasn't this happening to Acrest Designs before we got there? What we find is that what we saw as an inherent design inefficiency was actually a careful calibration to allow the debris to pass through the system unfettered. With this in mind, we went back to the drawing board. We decided to come up with a truly collaborative design between the, the old Acrest turbines and the new Purdue designs, such that they look almost identical. And in fact, they are nearly identical. The big difference, however, is the engineering justification that goes behind our design. We can look to the numbers and say, yes, this is truly an, a more efficient design. It was a perfect combination of the Cameroonian practicality and the Purdue engineering design efficiency. The result was a huge success. So this is a video from our first prototype testing, and that happened just last summer. So now with this in mind, with the success story, let's go back and take a look at our critical success criteria. Do you notice anything missing? In retrospect, I'd like to add number five, humility. The ability to understand one's place in context, to admit your shortcomings, and to learn before teaching. When I first set foot in Africa, almost three years ago, this is what I saw. This is what I was conditioned to see. But now, three years later, and four site visits later, this is what I see. These are real people. They're not stereotypes. They're not preconceptions. They're not character, car caricatures. These are my colleagues and my equals. To them, I'm not a hope giver. I'm not an empowerer. I'm not a life changer. I'm not a teacher. I'm just a student. We're all students and there's still plenty for us to learn. Thank you. <laughs>